Memoirs by Pablo Neruda Mexico blossoming and thorny My government sent me to Mexico oppressed to the breaking point by the memory of so many painful experiences and such chaos in 1941 came to the Anahuac Plateau to breathe what Alfonso Rice hailed as the most transparent region of the air Mexico with its prickly pear and its serpent Mexico blossoming and thorny dry and lashed by hurricane winds violent in outline and color violent in eruption and creation surrounded me with its magic and its extraordinary light I traveled through it for years from market to market because Mexico is to be found in its markets not in the guttural songs of the movies or in the false image of the Mexican in sombrero with mustache and pistol Mexico is a land of crimson and phosphorescent turquoise shawls Mexico is a land of earthen bowls and pitchers and fruit lying open to a swarm of insects Mexico is an infinite countryside of steel blue century plants with yellow thorns. The most beautiful markets in the world have all this to offer. Fillet and wool, clay and weaving looms give evidence of the incredible skill of the fertile and timeless fingers of the Mexicans. I drifted through Mexico, I roamed over all its coasts, along its steep coastlines set ablaze by uninterrupted flares of shimmering lightning. I came down from Topolobampo in Sinalo, past names indigenous to this hemisphere, harsh names willed to Mexico by the gods, when men less cruel than those gods came to rule its lands. I traveled through all those mysterious and majestic syllables from the dawn of time. Sonora and Yucatan, Anahuac, rising like a cold brazier that draws to itself the mixed aromas of the land, from Nayarit to Mycoacan, from where you can make out smoke from the islet of Janitsio and the odor of corn and maguey drifting up from Jalisco and sulfur from the new volcano Paracutfin blending in with the wet fragrance of fish from Lake Pascuaro Mexico the last of the magic countries because of its age and its history its music and its geography working my way like a tramp over those rocks forever scourged by blood rocks crisscrossed by a wide ribbon of blood and moss i felt mighty and ancient worthy to walk among such timeless things abrupt valleys partitioned off by immense walls of rock tall hills that looked as if cut level with a knife immense tropical forests teeming with timber and serpents birds and legends in that vast land made habitable as far as the eye can see by man's struggle through the ages in its huge spaces I found that we Chile and Mexico are the two countries most unlike each other in all America. I have never been moved by the conventional niceties of protocol that lead the ambassador of Japan looking at Chile's cherry trees to find that we are alike or the Englishman experiencing the fog along our coast or the Argentine or German seeing our snow to find that we are much like all other countries. I delight in the diversity of landscapes on this planet, the varied products of the earth in every latitude. I don't mean to detract in any way from Mexico, a place I love, by describing it as not even remotely resembling our ocean-washed and grain-rich land. I only hold up its differences so that our America may be seen on all its levels, its great heights and its depths. And in America, perhaps on the whole planet no country is more profoundly human than mexico and its people in its brilliant achievements as well as its gigantic errors one sees the same chain of grand generosity deep rooted vitality inexhaustible history and limitless growth we made a turn off one day into fishing villages whose nets are so diaphanous they look like huge butterflies returning to the waters to pick up the silver scales they are missing through mining centers whose metal turns from hard ingot to resplendent geometric forms almost as soon as it is out of the depths over roads where catholic convents loom thick and thorny like giant cactus plants through markets where the rich colors and flavors of vegetables displayed like flowers make you dizzy and crossing mexico like this we reached yucatan the submerged cradle of the oldest race in the world the idolatrous maya 
There the earth has been shaken by history and by the germinating seed. Side by side with the century plant, the ruins steeped in human intelligence and sacrifices are still growing. Having crossed the last roads, we come to the vast territory where the ancient peoples of Mexico left their embroidered history hidden away in the jungle. There we find a new water, the most mysterious water on earth. It is not sea, stream, river, or any of the waters we know. In Yucatan, the water is all under the ground, which may crack open suddenly, producing enormous jungle pools whose sides, overgrown with tropical vegetation, leave open to view, down below, a very deep water, deep as the sky, and green. The Mayas discovered those fissures in the earth called cenotes and defied them with their strange rites. Like all religions, in the beginning there's consecrated necessity and fertility, and the land's aridity was vanquished by those hidden waters for which the earth had opened. Then for thousands of years on the rims of the sacred pools, first the indigenous and then the invaders' religion increased the mystery of the waters. From the banks of the cenote, after nuptial ceremonies, hundreds of virgins decked with flowers and gold and laden with jewels were hurled into the whirling, bottomless waters. Garlands and golden crowns would float up from the depths to the surface, but the maidens stayed in the mud of the bottom, held fast by their gold chains. Thousands of years later, only a tiny portion of the jewels has been recovered and they are in the display cases of Mexican and U.S. Museums I went into that wilderness, not in search of gold, but seeking the cries of the drowned maidens. In the shrieks of the birds, I seemed to hear the hoarse anguish of the virgins, and in their swift flight, as they swept over the gloomy deeps of the timeless waters, I saw the yellow hands of the dead young girls. Once I watched a dove light on a statue that stretches its bright stone hand over the eternal waters and the air. An eagle may have been after it. It did not belong in that place whose only birds, the roadrunner with its stammer, the quetzal with its fabulous plumes, the turquoise hummingbird, and the birds of prey, conquered the jungle for their rapine, for their splendor. The dove lighted on the statue's hand, like a white snowflake among tropical rocks. I gazed at her because she came from another world, from a measured and harmonious world, from a Pythagorean column or a Mediterranean round number. She had stopped on the edge of the darkness, she respected my silence, for I had become part of this original American, blood-stained, ancient world, and my eyes followed her flight until they lost her in the sky. The Mexican Painters Mexico's intellectual life was dominated by painting. Mexican painters covered the city with history and geography, with civil strife, with fierce controversies. Jose Clement Orozco, lean, one-armed titan, has his place on an elevated peak, a sort of Goya in his phantasmagorical country. I talk to him often. The violence that haunted his work seemed alien to his personality. He had the gentleness of a potter who has lost his hand at the potter's wheel but feels he must go on creating worlds with his other hand. His soldiers and their women, his peasants gunned down by overseers, his sarcophagi with horrible crucified bodies, are immortal in our Native American painting, bearing witness to our cruelty. By this time Diego Rivera had done so much work, and so much squabbling with everyone, that this burly painter was a legend. Looking at him, it seemed strange to me that he didn't have scaly fishtails or cloven hoofs. Diego Rivera had always been a fabricator. In Paris, before the First World War, Ilya Ehrenberg had published a book about his exploits and hoaxes. The Extraordinary Adventures of Giulio Giurenito Thirty years later Diego Rivera was still a great master as painter and teller of tall stories. He used to recommend the eating of human flesh as a healthy diet much favored by the greatest gourmets. He gave out recipes for cooking people of all ages. At other times he went to great lengths theorizing on lesbian love, maintaining that it was the only normal relationship, 
as proved by the oldest historical remains found in excavations he himself had directed sometimes he would ramble on for hours working his hooded indian eyes and telling me all about his jewish background at other times forgetting the previous conversations he swore to me that he was general romel's father but this confidence must be kept very secret as its disclosure could have grave international consequences his extraordinarily persuasive tone and his serene way of delineating the minutest and most incredible details made him a marvelous charlatan whose charm can never be forgotten by anyone who knew him david alfaro sequeros was in jail then someone had sent him on an armed raid of trotsky's home i met him in prison and outside as well because we used to go out with commandant paris rule for the warden to have a drink somewhere where we wouldn't be noticed too much we would return late at night and i would bid david goodbye with an embrace and he would stay there behind bars on one of those trips back from the streets to the prison with sequeros i met his brother jesus sequeros a most unusual man crafty in the good sense of the word comes closest to describing him he glided alongside the walls without making a sound or any perceptible movement suddenly you noticed him right behind or beside you he seldom spoke and when he did speak it was barely above a whisper which did not prevent him from hauling around just as quietly 40 or 50 pistols in a small bag it was just my luck to open the bag once absent mindedly and discover with a shock the arsenal of black pearl and silver handles it all meant nothing because jest sequeros was as peace loving as his brother david was tempestuous jest was also a gifted artist and actor a mime without moving his body or his hands without letting out the slightest sound acting only with his face whose lines he changed at will turning it into a series of masks he gave vivid impressions of terror anguish joy tenderness he bore that pale ghostly face through the labyrinth of his life emerging from time to time with all those pistols that he never used those volcanic painters kept the public in line sometimes they got into tremendous debates during one of these having run out of arguments diego rivera and sequeros drew huge pistols and fired almost as one man not at each other but at the wings of the plaster of paris angels on the theater's ceiling when the heavy plaster wings started falling on the heads of the people in the audience the theater emptied out and the discussion ended with a powerful smell of gunpowder in a deserted hall rufino tamayo was not living in mexico at this time complex and passionate as mexican as the fruit or the woven goods in the markets his paintings came to us from new york no parallel can be drawn between the painting of diego rivera and that of david alfaro sequeros diego has a classicist's feeling for line with that infinitely undulating line a kind of historian's calligraphy he gradually tied together mexico's history and brought out in high relief its events traditions and tragedies sequeros is the explosion of a volcanic temperament that combines an amazing technique and painstaking research during clandestine sorties from jail and conversations on every topic sequeros and i planned his final deliverance on a visa i personally affixed to his passport he traveled to chile with his wife angelica arinales The people of Mexico had built a school in the Chilean city of Chillán which had been destroyed by earthquakes and in that Mexico school Sequeros painted one of his extraordinary murals The government of Chile repaid me for that service to our nation's culture by suspending me from my consular duties for 2 months Napoleon Ubico I decided to visit Guatemala and set out by car We passed through the isthmus of Tehuantepec, Mexico's golden region, with its women dressed like butterflies and a scent of honey and sugar in the air. Next, we went into the great forest of Chiapas. We would stop the car at night, intimidated by the noises, the jungle's telegraph messages. 
Here, there, and everywhere, thousands of cicadas transmitted a deafening sound. Enigmatic Mexico spread its green shadows over ancient structures, remote paintings, jewels and monuments, colossal heads, stone animals. All this lay about in the forest, the untold riches of fabulous Mexico. Across the border, on the highest ridges of Central America, the narrow Guatemalan road dazzled me with its lianas and mammoth vegetation, and later with its placid lakes, high up in the mountains, like eyes forgotten by wasteful gods, and finally with its pine forests and broad primordial rivers where manatees peered out of the water like human beings. I stayed for a week with Miguel Angel Asturias, who had not yet become known for his successful novels. We realized we were born brothers and spent almost every day together. In the evening, we would plan visits to faraway places on mountains shrouded in mist or to United Fruits tropical ports. Guatemalans did not have the right of free speech, and no one talked politics. The walls had ears and could turn you in. Sometimes we would stop the car on a high plateau and make sure nobody was lurking behind some tree, and we would discuss the situation avidly. The despot's name was Ubico and he had been running the country for a good many years. He was a corpulent man, with cold, cruel eyes. His word was law, and nothing in Guatemala was done without his explicit approval. I met one of his secretaries, now my friend, a revolutionary. For arguing back about something, some petty detail, he had been bound on the spot to a column in the presidential office and whipped mercilessly by Ubico himself. The young poets asked me to give a poetry reading. They sent Ubico a telegram requesting permission. All my friends and many young students filled the auditorium. I was happy to read my poems, they seemed to open a tiny crack in the window of a vast prison. The chief of police sat conspicuously in the front row. Later I found out that four machine guns had been trained on me and the audience, ready to burst into action if the chief of police interrupted the reading by leaving his seat in a half. But nothing of the kind happened, the man stayed and listened to my poems to the end. Later someone wanted to introduce me to the dictator, a man with a Napoleon complex. He liked to wear a lock of hair on his forehead, and had his photograph taken a number of times in Bonaparte's famous pose. I was told that it was dangerous to turn down the offer, but I preferred not to shake his hand and went back to Mexico as fast as I could. Anthology of Pistols Mexico in those days was more gun-totting than gunfighter. There was a cult of the revolver, a fetishism of the 45. Calls were whipped out at the drop of a pin. Parliamentary candidates and newspapers would start their depistolization campaigns, but would quickly realize that it was easier to pull a Mexican's tooth than wrest his beloved gun from him. Once a group of poets entertained me with an outing in a flavaladen boat. Fifteen or twenty bards met at Lake Zoxamilco and took me on this ride, hemmed in by water and blossoms, over canals and through a maze of everglades used for flowery rides since the time of the Aztecs. Every inch of the boat is decorated with flowers, overflowing with marvelous patterns and colors. The hands of the Mexicans, like the hands of the Chinese, are incapable of creating anything ugly, whether they work in stone, silver, clay, or carnations. Well, during the ride, after a good many teculas, one of the poets insisted that, as a special honor of a different kind, I should fire into the sky his beautiful pistol whose grip was decorated with silver and gold designs. The colleague nearest to him whipped out his own pistol and, carried away with enthusiasm, slapped aside the FIR. T-man's weapon and invited me to do the shooting with his. Each of the other rhapsodists unsheathed his pistol on the instant, and a free-for-all ensued, they all raised their guns over my head, each insisting I choose his instead of one of the others. As the precarious panoply of pistols being waved in front of my nose or passed under my arms became more and more dangerous, it occurred to me to take a huge, 
typical sombrero and gather all the firearms into it, asking the battalion of poets for their guns in the name of poetry and peace. Everyone obeyed and I was able to confiscate the weapons and keep them safe in my house for several days. I am the only poet, I believe, in whose honor an anthology of pistols has been put together. Why Neruda? The salt of the earth had gathered in Mexico, exiled writers of every nationality had rallied to the camp of Mexican freedom, while the war dragged on in Europe, with victory upon victory going to Hitler's forces, which already occupied France and Italy. Among those present were Anna Sayers and the Czech humorist Egan Irvin Kish, who has since died. Kish left some fascinating books and I greatly admired his wonderful talent, his childlike curiosity, and his dexterity at ledger domain. No sooner had he entered my house than he would pull an egg out of his ear or swallow, one by one, as many as seven coins, which this very fine, impoverished exile could well use for himself. We had known each other in Spain, and when he showed incessant curiosity about my reason for using the name Neruda, which I was not born with, I kidded him, Great Kish, you may have uncovered the secret of Colonel Redl, the famous Austrian spy case of 1914. But you will never clear up the mystery of my name. And so it was. He died in Prague, having been accorded every honor his liberated country could give him, but this professional interloper was never able to find out why Neruda called himself Neruda. The answer was so simple and so lacking in glamour that I was careful not to give the secret away. When I was 14, my father was always at me about my literary endeavours. He didn't like the idea of having a son who was a poet. To cover up the publication of my first poems, I looked for a last name that would throw him completely off the scent. I took the Czech name from a magazine, without knowing it was the name of a great writer loved by a whole nation, the author of elegant ballads and narrative poems, whose monument stood in Prague's Mala Strana quarter. Many years later, the first thing I did when I got to Czechoslovakia was to place a flower at the foot of the bearded statue. The Eve of Pearl Harbor Wenceslao Rox, from Salmanca, and Constancia de la Mora, a Republican as well as a relative of the Duke of Mora, and the author of the book In Place of Splendor, which was a bestseller in North America, and the poets Le Six and Felipe, Juan Rejano, Mirano Villa, Herrera Petere, and the painters Miguel Prito and Rodriguez Luna used to come to my house. They were all Spaniards. Vittorio Vidali, the famed Commandant Carlos of the 5th Regiment, and Mario Montagnana, Italian exiles, full of memories, amazing stories, and possessed of a culture always in flux. Jackie Sustil and Gilbert Medioni were also there. They were Gaullist leaders, representatives of Free France. Mexico also swarmed with voluntary or forced exiles from Central America, Guatemalans, Salvadorians, Hondurans. All this gave it an international flavor, and sometimes my home, an old villa in the San Angel neighborhood, pulsated as if it were the heart of the world. In connection with Sustel, who was then a left-wing socialist and who years later, as political leader of the attempted rebel coup in Algiers, would cause President de Gaulle so much trouble, something happened to me that I must tell about. We were far into the year 1941. The Nazis had laid siege to Leningrad and were penetrating farther into Soviet territory. The foxy Japanese military leaders, committed to the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo axis, were in a spot, Germany might win the war, and they would be deprived of their share of the spoils. Various rumors were circulating around the globe. Zero R, when the mighty Japanese forces would be unleashed in the east, loomed closer. Meanwhile, in Washington, a Japanese peace mission was curtsying and bowing to the United States government. There wasn't the slightest room for doubt that the Japanese would launch a surprise attack, for Blitzkrieg was the bloody order of the day. To make my story clear, I must mention that an old Nippon steamship line linked Japan to Chile. 
I traveled on those ships more than once and I knew them very well. They called at our ports and their captains spent their time buying scrap iron and taking photographs. They touched shore at points along the coastline of Chile, Peru, and Ecuador, going as far as the Mexican port of Manzanillo, where they pointed their bows toward Yokohama, across the Pacific. Well, one day, while I was still Consul General of Chile in Mexico, I received a visit from seven Japanese who were in a rush to obtain a Chilean visa. They had come from San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other ports on the North American West Coast. A certain uneasiness was written across their faces. They were dressed well and their papers were in order, they could have been engineers or business executives. I asked them, of course, why they wanted to take the very first plane to Chile, having just arrived in Mexico. They replied that they intended to catch a Japanese ship in Tocopilla, a nitrate shipping port in northern Chile. I countered that there was no need to travel to Chile, at the other end of the continent, for this, because that same Japanese line called at Manzanillo, which they could reach even on foot, if they wished with time to spare. They exchanged embarrassed glances and smiles and talked among themselves in their own language. They consulted the secretary of the Japanese embassy, who was with them. He decided to be open with me and said, Look, colleague, this ship happens to have changed its itinerary and won't be coming to Manzanillo anymore. And, therefore, these distinguished specialists must catch it at the Chilean port. A confused vision flashed across my mind, this was something very important. I asked for their passports, photographs, for data about their work in the United States, etc., and told them to return the next day. They objected. They had to have the visas immediately and would be willing to pay any price. I was playing for time. I explained that I did not have the authority to issue visas on the spot, we would discuss it the next day. I was left to myself. Little by little, the puzzle unraveled in my mind. Why the hasty flight from North America and the pressing need for the visas? And why was the Japanese ship changing its route for the first time in 30 years? What could it mean? Then it dawned on me. Of course, this was an important, well-informed group, Japanese spies beating a hasty retreat from the United States because something critical was about to happen. And that could be nothing but Japan's entry into the war. The Japanese in my story were in on the secret. The conclusion I had reached left me in an extremely nervous state. What could I do? I did not know the English or the North American representatives of the Allied Nations in Mexico. I was in direct contact only with those officially accredited as General de Gaulle's delegates who had access to the Mexican government. I got in touch with them at once and explained the situation. We had at hand the names of the Japanese and vital information about them. Should the French decide to take steps, the Japanese would be trapped. I presented my arguments eagerly at first, and then impatiently, before the indifferent Gaullists. Young diplomats, I told them, here is your chance to cover yourselves with glory. Find out the secret of these Japanese spies. As for me, I won't give them the visa. But you have to make a quick decision. This fast and loose game lasted two days longer. Sustel took no interest in the matter. They would do nothing, and I, a Chilean consul, could take it no further. Since I refused to grant them a visa, the Japanese immediately obtained diplomatic passports, went to the Chilean embassy, and made it in time to take the ship in Tokopila. One week later, the world would wake up to the news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Myself as Malacologist Years ago, a newspaper in Chile printed a story about my good friend, the celebrated Professor Julian Huxley, who arrived in Santiago and asked for me at the airport. Neruda the poet, the newsman questioned him. 
No. I don't know any poet by the name of Neruda. I want to speak to Neruda the malacologist. That Greek word means specialist in mollusks. I was delighted by this story, which was intended to nettle me. It could not possibly be true, because Huxley and I had known each other for years and he is a sharp fellow, much more quick-witted and genuine than his well-known brother, all this. In Mexico I roamed the beaches, dived into the clear, temperate waters, and collected magnificent seashells. Later, in Cuba and elsewhere, I swapped and bought, received as gifts and filched, there's no such thing as an honest collector, gradually swelling my sea treasure until it filled room after room in my house. I own the rarest specimens from the China Sea and the Philippines, from Japan and the Baltic, Antarctic conches and palmitas from Cuba, painter shells dressed in red and saffron, blue and purple like Caribbean dancers. One of the few specimens I did not have, I admit, was a land snail from Brazil's Mato Grosso. I saw one once but couldn't buy it, and I was not able to travel into the jungle to get one. It was all green, as beautiful as a new emerald. I became such an avid collector that I visited the most remote seas. Friends also began to hunt for conches, to become snail crazed. When I had gathered together 15,000 shells, they filled every last shelf and began to spill from tables and chairs. Books on conchology or malacology, call it what you will, overflowed my library. So, one day I took my whole collection and carried it to the university in huge crates, making my first donation to my alma mater. It was a famous collection by then. Like any good South American institution, my university received it with praises and panegyrics and buried it away in a basement. No one has seen it since. Araucania While I was far away, at my post on the islands of the remote archipelago, the sea hummed to me and the silent world was filled with things that spoke to my solitude. But cold and hot wars corrupted the consular service and eventually made each consul an automaton, without personality, unable to make any decisions for himself, and his work became suspiciously close to that of the police. The ministry insisted on my checking the ethnic origins of immigrants, Africans, Asians, and Jews could not enter my country. This stupidity reached such extremes that I, too, became its victim when I started a handsome magazine, without a subsidy from the National Treasury, and named it Araucania. On the cover I used the picture of a lovely Araucanian wearing a toothy smile. That's all the foreign minister needed to give me a severe dressing down for what he considered something debasing, even though Don Pedro Aguayo Cerda, whose pleasant and noble face had all the features of our mixed race, was president of the republic. It is common knowledge that the Araucanians were crushed and, finally, forgotten or conquered. What's more, history is written by the conquerors or by those who reap the spoils of victory. There are few races worthier than the Araucanian. Someday we'll see Araucanian universities, books printed in Araucanian, and we'll realize how much we have lost with their clarity, their purity and volcanic energy. The absurd, racial, pretensions of some South American countries, which are themselves the results of many national origins and mixed breeding, are a colonialist vice. They want to set up a days where a handful of snobs, scrupulously white or light-skinned, can appear in society, posturing in front of pure irons or pretentious tourists. Fortunately, all this is becoming a thing of the past and the UN is filling up with black and Mongolian representatives, in short, as the sap of intelligence rises, the foliage of all the races is gradually displaying all the colors of its leaves. I ended by getting fed up and one day I resigned from my career as Consul General forever. Magic and Mystery Furthermore, I realized that the Mexican world repressed, violent, and nationalistic, cloaked in its pre-Columbian civility would get along without my presence or approval. When I decided to return to my country, 
I understood less about Mexican life than when I came to Mexico. Arts and letters thrived in rival circles, but God help any outsider who sided with or against any individual or group, everyone came down on him. When I was almost ready to leave, I was honored with a monstrous public demonstration, a dinner for almost 3,000 persons, not counting hundreds who couldn't even get in. Several presidents sent congratulations. Still, Mexico is the touchstone of America, and it was not an accident that the solar calendar of ancient America, the node of irradiation, wisdom, and mystery, was carved there. Everything could happen. Everything did happen there. The only opposition newspaper was subsidized by the government. It was the most dictatorial democracy anyone can imagine. I recall a tragic event that left me badly shaken. A strike was dragging on in a factory, with no solution in sight. The strikers' wives got together and agreed to try to see the president and tell him perhaps of their privations and their distress. Of course, they had no weapons. Along the way they got some flowers to present to the head of state and his wife. A guard halted the women as they were entering the palace, and they were allowed no further. The president would not receive them, they would have to go to the appropriate government bureau. Anyway, they must vacate the premises. It was an ultimatum. Ne women pleaded their cause. They wouldn't be any trouble. They just wanted to deliver the flowers to the president and ask if he could do something to settle the strike soon. Their children had no food, they couldn't go on like that. The officer of the guard refused to relay any message. And the women would not go. Then a volley of shots from the direction of the palace guard splintered the air. Six or seven women were killed on the spot and many others wounded. A hasty funeral took place on the following day. I had believed an immense procession would follow the caskets of the assassinated women, but only a few people showed up. Oh, yes, the union leader made a speech. He was known as a prominent revolutionary. His speech at the cemetery was in an irreproachable style. I read the entire text the next day in the newspapers. It did not contain a single line of protest, not a single angry word or any demand that those responsible for such an atrocity be put on trial. Two weeks later, no one even spoke of the massacre. And I have never seen it mentioned in writing by anyone. The president was an Aztec ruler, a thousand times more untouchable than England's royal family. No newspaper could criticize the exalted functionary either in jest or seriously, without suffering immediate consequences. Mexican dramas are so clothed in the picturesque that one comes away astounded by all the allegory that is every day more remote from the essential throb of life, the blood-spattered skeleton. The philosophers have become euphuistic and launch into existentialist dissertations that seem foolish under a volcano. Civilian action is intermittent and difficult. Submission takes on varying aspects that stratify around the throne. But every kind of magic is always appearing and reappearing in Mexico, from the volcano born before a peasant's eyes in his humble orchard, while he was planting beans, to the wild search for the skeleton of Cots, who, rumor has it, rests in Mexican soil with his gold helmet protecting the conquistador's skull these many centuries, and the no less intense hunt for the remains of the Aztec Emperor Cuauhtémoc. Lost four centuries ago, they keep showing up here and there, safeguarded by secretive Indians, only to sink back time and again into unfathomable darkness. Mexico lives on in me like a small stray eagle circulating through my veins. Only death will fold its wings over my sleeping soldier's heart.